Thank you so much, Marie. That was a very fascinating presentation. We've actually had a number of different people talk about dark skies on the VLD community, but it was really inspiring to hear you actually define both extremes of light, like, you know, having too much and also not having enough. And it was really interesting to hear also about the what that effect in one city can have on, on another city 200 kilometers away. And also bringing attention to Article, uh, was it 2.5, the Universal Declaration? 25. 25, yeah. sorry. The Universal okay. Declaration. And uh, I found it interesting to hear that because it, you, you were almost talking about it from a, uh, a good governance point of view. Um, yeah. Which I, I think is a little bit different to, to what other ha others have talked to. So then you're actually ta tackling that issue, not just you know, on a, a local scale or just uh, individualizing it, but we all have a part to play in it uh, also at a governmental level. Absolutely. Would you, would you say there's a bit of a, um, I think you mentioned at the end about how important it is to have balance. One can quickly become the other extreme, right? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, how how would you say that it, it is best done to to avoid the the risk of, of that happening? I think well, everybody will say this, but education is a big part of it, but not necessarily education on a local or a personal level, right? We can we can certainly educate all of our uh, students, all of our lighting designers, even our architects, but I think it has to be an education at a governmental level, right? Because the governments are the ones that are setting the rules. They are the ones that are in charge of creating these guidelines. And they may reach out to us for um, for input, but at the end of the day, they are the ones that are putting this out there, right? So to give you an example, in New York City a while ago, there was um, uh, a change in the regulation, right? They wanted to go into LEDs and they decided that 4,000K was the best uh, color temperature to go with. And all yeah. lighting designers, of course, raised their hands and said, hey, wait a minute, this may not be the most, uh, the, the best approach. Yes, sure, you can have 4,000K for better visual acuity in the streets, but New York City being such a populated city, then you will have this bright blue light um, coming out of the streets and entering people's houses. And this may not be the healthiest approach yet. So even when governments have good intentions and they, they get into this whole idea of, well, let's reduce uh, carbon emissions, right? Let's go with energy savings. There may still be a need for us to get involved in those conversations and, and bring the knowledge that we have to make sure that whatever regulations, whatever guidelines are set for cities and communities and neighborhoods, they will be the best yet. And that's where I think our input needs to go to, right? Because this presentation, as you said, it deals with it on a much of a social level than it is a technical or a scientific level. It yeah. does take the, the science into the presentation to explain the point, but it is, we are talking about a social problem here. It's not just uh, an environmental issue. It, it is a, a social problem mm -hmm. that we're starting to see. So definitely going back to your question, we need to get ourselves involved in, in the, uh, the creation of regulation and the creation of guidelines. Um, and make sure that we are informing the people that are making the decisions so that the decisions that are made are the best possible. Yeah. Well, thank you for that answer. That actually brings sure. me to another point that you made um, about this. I think it had to do with the Bordeaux measurement that you showed mm -hmm. um, and whether to mitigate or to preserve. That is yeah. more focused on how to preserve the dark sky, but how would that tie into the light poverty side of things where that approach might not work the same? Well, so the reason why I show the, the scale is it's really because this presentation initially was done for a group of people here in the Middle East. And as you know, here in the Middle East, there has been a lot of um, work into developing areas that have never been developed before, right? Yeah. And 
if we are going into these areas, it means that we're going to introduce lighting into the environment. So obviously we need to understand certainly where we are, right? Most likely these areas are gonna have a perfect pristine night sky. So what can we do to preserve that as much as possible and not introduce light pollution into the environment in a way that it will not just affect that area, as I said before, but it may affect many areas around it, right? But in terms of light, um, in sorry, in terms of light poverty, where I think the scale is going to help us quite a lot is that as you also saw, I'm, I'm not just classifying light poverty as an area that has no lighting, but I'm also trying to bring attention to areas where there is lighting, it's just not the right kind of lighting, right? Um, when we, and I, I'm, I'm gonna make a, a small break here. Yeah. Um, you know, when people talk about um, poverty, we tend to think of people that lack something completely, right? But if you think about it clearly, poverty is also a situation when you have low quality of something. For example, somebody that is poor of health, it doesn't mean that they have no health at all. It means just that health is not the quality that it should be. So what I'm trying to sh uh, shift here is the, the thinking that in even in inner cities where there's plenty of light for everyone to go around, we can still have a situation of light poverty just by introducing a low quality lighting system into the environment, right? And so this is also where the Bordel scale can help. Cities that are very, very polluted, maybe they need to be relooked at because it may be that in certain areas, the situation is that we're incorporating lighting that is not adequate for the neighborhoods. And this is at the same time causing two problems, light poverty and light pollution at the same time. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Now that's uh, a really nice distinction to, to make because it's often um, overlooked and sometimes it can get a little bit con confusing on, on the yeah. different thing. We actually had our own personal experience uh, here in Western Australia. Um, I loved how you showed before about the effect of poor lighting on the environment from the, the different animals, turtles, breeding and the predatory and migratory patterns. We had a project in a, the northwest of Western Australia, which uh, was a hotel which was right on the beach. Not a huge hotel, but it happened to be located directly opposite a turtle breeding beach. So all the lighting that there was, that was a very interesting one because uh, they, we also had the environmental people and, and you know, the, the, it was quite tightly regulated about what we could do to not disturb the the breeding patterns of, of the turtles on that beach. So all the, you know, the, the the quality of light ended up being a really important part of it. Also controlling the light so there wasn't that trespass, like you said, the, the pollution and the, and the trespass from having that amber type of lighting, using low bollards, having indirect uh, light type of lighting and, and really controlling where that is. And at the same time, not having that uh, affect the, the social and cultural aspect of the hotel because it still needs to be a place where people go and you know visit and enjoy exactly. themselves so that's and people uh, need to uh, feel safe and 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 comfortable right so exactly. it, and, and that comes back to the idea that darkness is not a comfortable environment when when a place is too dark it makes you feel a little a little scared, right? It's like you right. don't want to move. You you don't you don't know if you're safe or not. So exactly what you're saying. It's it's very important to make that distinction, right? It means that incorporating lighting into an environment doesn't have to be damaging, right? We just need to make sure that the quality of lighting is right for the environment as well as ourselves, because darkness is not comfortable at all. <laughs> No, and, and, and that, that's why exactly. I mentioned my 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 little story at the beginning because I I was really having this sort of like dual moment, right? I am so fascinating what with the stars and everything, but at the same time, when I look down and I look around me, it's like I don't see anything. I better not even move <laughs> because yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where and, I can go. And moving right in front of your eyes, that's how dark it is. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And, um, and and it does, we are, unfortunately, well, maybe it's not an, an unfortunate, but it 
we are beings that have uh, developed our our environment, our neighborhoods, our relationships around the availability of light, right? Um, so we need to not only accept that, but we also need to understand how we can still function after hours without necessarily damaging the environment around us. Right? Definitely, 100%. It is, 100%. it is that balance. It's a very difficult one to achieve, and we're still trying to figure out what that balance is. And I, I, I think that's perfectly fine. It's just that I would not push for one end or the other, right? Because at the end of the day, these are both extremes, and extremes are never good. So tell me a bit more about the seawater lamp uh, initiative that you were talking about. Maybe um, that was just something you you mentioned uh, in passing, but that is something that I haven't heard of before. Do you know anything more about it? I don't know much about it. I did see it in uh, one of the online uh, mag design magazines, uh, and I thought it was fascinating because obviously me being from Venezuela, I, I really felt attracted to that to to that program so yeah. the 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 why you people in this area are indigenous people of course and they they still live in a way or another a little bit like they used to live um before the colonization of the americans right not exactly of course the development has changed their way of life to a certain extent but the yeah. fact is that they they do not have uh the same access to electric lighting as everybody else however it is needed Right. Um, otherwise, for them, it would be very difficult to to move around. I mean, if you think about people that have no electric lighting, then they will always find or try to find a way to um, to to create light. Well, sometimes it's kerosene lamps, sometimes it's torches, whatever it is. But it, it's not going to be a safe environment, right? When you introduce fire into your environment, there's always uh, some level of risk. So this this lamp, like I said, is the, the, the one thing that I know is that in this area being in the coast, um, it just uses the environment to create the lighting that they need. They can fill the water with sea, with, sorry, the, the lamp with seawater and the, the lamp will ionize the water and create light and create electricity. And my understanding is that that ionization process can last a couple of days. So they don't have to go and, and gather water every, you know, four or five hours or something like that. So in that yeah. sense, it's actually very, very useful. Because when you mentioned it, I thought, oh, wow, that, that is something I have not heard. But what a clever idea that is. <laughs> and I'm sure, hey, I, I, I only mentioned two programs here, right? But I'm sure, and I think I've seen a couple of uh, other. Yeah, there are many more programs out there. Um, for example, my husband has a, a little lamp here from, I think it's a friend that gave it to him. They were trying to address light poverty in certain parts of Africa. And it's just a little square that uh, gets charged with sunlight throughout the day. And then it just functions at night. And it has a similar approach to the seawater lamp in the sense that you can not just uh, use it for light, but you can also charge certain devices from it. So it creates electricity, not just light. But being light such an important part of our life after dark, then yeah. obviously that is one of the main things that they want to um, yeah. that they want to use the these gadgets for. I loved how you brought up as well, because this is something that I haven't also um, known before. You mentioned it was about the av the global average light uh yep. was it a light the, uh, pollution yep the global yeah. it's a the average global uh brightness of so if brightness. you take all this around the world and you create a global average right the the ones that are the least bright against the ones that are the brightest and yes. you create a global average then the the top 10 that we showed here is uh, actually cities or metropolitan areas that are way above that global well I was, I was quite surprised to see st petersburg uh, on there and some of uh, you know the, the russian cities and even there was uh, finland was on there and yep. um i wouldn't have thought that but yeah some, some of the surprising ones actually um but, i can't 
I can't exactly say why, um, obviously, because this is just a ranking that in my in my research uh, I found and, and a friend actually shared it with me. But it would be interesting to find out whether this, mm-hmm. you know, snow has a lot to do with that. You know, St. Okay. Peter, St. Petersburg, Moscow, Finland, of, of course, all of those cities, they spend a lot of the year with the snow cover and being, you know, snow being white, obviously, or light mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. color. Yeah. I wonder if that comes into play because of the reflection. I haven't actually gone into researching that, but when I saw the ranking, that was my my thought. Maybe this has something to play. Coming back to a uh, regulatory a governmental level, um, when you talked about uh, again, mitigating and preserving. Do you see that being a bit like them trying to tackle climate change, where every country is trying to maybe set targets for themselves, um, a bit like they did with the Paris Agreement for, for trying to uh, mitigate <laughs> global warming? Is yes. this something <laughs> similar? Like, how do you see that? <laughs> Yes, I do think the shift to LEDs is something that has been done just to save energy and tackle the carbon emissions. Absolutely. Um, And that's why I mentioned in the presentation that uh, many, many communities are concerned about shifting from their legacy sources to LED because the thought process is, oh, LEDs are going to be brighter or LEDs are going to be cooler, right? and the problem is that many cities have have made this shift without really thinking about it. It's more, I'm going to look at it from the point of view of energy. I'm not looking at it from the point of view of quality, quality lighting, right? Um, again, as an example, uh, back home, back in Venezuela, there was a moment in time a few years ago where the government wanted people to lower their um, their use of energy in the evenings, and so they promoted the use of uh, compact fluorescent lighting. And of course, they just gave them away, right? Okay, come come get your lamps so that you pay less in energy. And it, yep. da- it did work in that sense, but it also backfired in the sense that people didn't like the quality of the light that they that they introduce into their homes. So mm. we have to look at, at street lighting and community lighting in the same way, right? It's not just about saving energy. You can still do that. Right, by by shifting to LEDs, but we also need to look at LEDs as this source that has many different uh, characteristics that we have to regulate. We need to look at the color temperature. You need to look at the blue, the availability of the blue spectrum. We need to look at um, the distribution of the light, whether it is full cut off or half cut off or um, any. I mean, there's so many different items that we have to look at. Also the dimming levels, like um, like uh, the examples that I that I showed in Tucson, right? Because at the end of the day, we're going from a legacy lamp that is not so smart to a, a lamp that has the ability to be smart, right? And we can use that. We can use that, that smart part of the LED lighting to go beyond just simply energy savings. But I do think, as you say, that the change in cities is coming from that 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 point of view. I mean, after after all, the carbon emissions is is something that we definitely need to take care of. Um, but we always need to be careful in how we move from one extreme to the other. Like I said, we always have to find a balance. <laughs> I think that's a um, a really great way. I think to to end the. Um, Q and A, I guess, after the presentation. So, thank you again. I th- I'm sure that our audience will have more questions, which, um, yeah, I guess they can come through whenever um, people want to comment. That that'll be great. And um, yeah, thanks again, Maria, for coming on to uh, doing your presentation for the virtual lighting design community. At um, at some point, we will be having a um, a panel discussion with. Okay. Uh, Others who have talked about a similar topic, um, I mentioned a couple of them, but we also had Charles Stone talk about Dark Sky and uh, Paulina Villalobos also talked about it. So we might organize a panel and we, you know, at, at a time when we come together and then we can actually delve a little bit more into what 
what each of us or, you know have have talked about in those presentations. I think that'd be another great way to uh, explore that topic a bit more if you're keen for that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That would be fantastic. Yeah, I love it. All right. We can all Thank bring you. our own uh, little piece of, <laughs> of knowledge into the conversation. Yeah, exactly. So like exactly. It's all about education. I think that's uh, yeah, also absolutely. What you mentioned is is the key. All right. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much to you and to the VLDC. Yeah, looking forward to more. <laughs> <laughs>